So we're going to start this morning with uh, with Josh Bloom, who uh, wrote the UHD, the interface to the uh, usurps, and um, specifically there's there's these techniques for calibrating uh, and and making better use of your usurp that we really wanted him to to come up here and, and expose and show you guys how to do different and interesting things with the UHD. All right, let me see. Is this on? Hello. All right. So Tom gave me an introduction. Um, Basically, this talk is the uh, logical follow-on to Matt's impairments talk from the last conference. So maybe you saw that at the last conference, or maybe you saw it online. I encourage you to go take a look at it. Uh, I will go over briefly some of the impairments mentioned, and uh, more specifically, I'm going to cover kind of how we compensate or deal with that with, uh, with the usurps. So uh, we're going to discuss uh, filter response is something I tacked on yesterday. Uh, from the talk we had, so I just want, I want to go over that. That was the half band versus CIC, and I'll be going over the IQ imbalance, uh, DC level impairments, and then some of the calibration utilities and uh, some kind of advanced tuning stuff you can do with UHD also to mitigate that. So to hop right in. <clears throat> the, going, this is back to the CIC versus half band discussion. This is a typical chain. Uh, down conversion and uh, up conversion chain in the FPGA. Um, you see uh, the RX chain and the TX chain are basically the same thing, just reverse. So we can just look at the RX, but you, you've got your ADC and we go into some front end corrections, which we're going to go over later. Uh, there's a cortic for frequency shifting. And uh, here's what we were really talking about is there's a CIC and two half bands in this chain. Now any one of these can be bypassed. So the particular rules to determine this Basically, your uh, decimation rate is going to be your FPGA DSP rate over your sample rate. Now, typically, if we're then to 10, this is 100 megahertz. So, jeez, um, uh, it's white on white. Basically, uh, if, if your decimation is odd, we're going to dump all of the decimation right into the CIC, and these half bands will be bypassed. If your decimation is even, we're going to have one half band in the chain, and then we're going to do the rest of it with the rest of the rays is going to be covered by the CIC. And if you happen to have um, modulo 4, we get both half bands in the chain and the CIC. So I think to, to show that visually, uh, kind of an analytics thing. This is, this is a, let's see, this is actually plotting out to uh, twice the uh, bandwidth, so you can really kind of see with a profile. But this is, this is a roll off of the CIC filter. Here's about where your uh, baseband spectrum is. And you can certainly see the, the 3dB cutoff point for the CIC filters like way back up here. And then here's your half band. You've got this nice, nice flat and then immediate roll off right near FS over 2. So this is why you really want to have a half band as the last thing in your chain. Now, if you've got a CIC and half band cascaded, you do see a little bit of roll off here from the uh, uh, CIC cascading with the half band. But so uh, moving on. <clears throat> uh, so, basically, uh, IQ imbalance distortion, we've got two types we've got, uh, that can happen in the analog domain over here. We've got magnitude and uh, phase distortion. Now, uh, magnitude distortion is going to happen really any time something in this chain versus I or Q is going to have a different amplitude level, you're going to get some kind of magnitude distortion. And... Um, and then uh, phase imbalance or phase distortion can happen, you know, uh, in here. We have, we've got a filter in here. We've got a filter in here. Either of those could have a different group delay of some sort. Or we've got our, uh, you know, LO and LO plus 90 degree offset here. And if this isn't perfectly 90, you'll also see some phase distortion. Uh, typically with the usurps, we tend to see some kind of mismatch in amplitude and very little phase. But it is possible, and we do correct for it. So um, many of you might have uh, seen this, that if you have uh, just a little, you know, GRC flow graph with FOT plot running and you put a test tone in, you know, you expect to see 10 megahertz and nothing here. And this, so this is actually a very good example of the IQ imbalance with just a simple test tone. Um, and, and what we try to do, and, and if, if you were to sweep this tone, across frequency here and here, you would actually see that the level of the imbalance slightly varies. Uh, it's mostly linear, but it actually isn't. Uh, but what, what we do in the usurp is a uh, linear compensation, which is relatively cheap in hardware. Um, 
if you take a look at this, we're basically multiplying part of i out and adding it into itself and part of q. Now, this may look a little confusing, but if you've ever seen a, uh, you know equation in a textbook for this, this is basically the same equation rearranged, but simplified for hardware use. You've got a, uh, two adders, and these are two uh, scalar multipliers. You don't see the uh, scalar hooked in here. So this is how we compensate for i and q. And I'll go a bit into how the uh, calibration utilities uh, effectively use this in kind of an automated sense later. Um, uh, the other distortion is uh, if you've got some DC level in the front end, you end up with, well, LO in the spectrum. And maybe you've seen this if you, uh, say, have like a BPSK or something like that, and you're like, what is that ugly little bump there? And that's your LO that's in there. So, um, you know, that's the main issue with uh, D the DC level of the front end. Uh, if you really want, you know, to see more, you know, potential uh, things about that, just check out Matt's impairments model. Or, uh, <clears throat> so what we do to correct that on, on the transmit, it's, it's really just as simple as uh, for a given uh, frequency, you can just set some kind of constant value here and just subtract it right out. And, that, and if, you, if you look at your uh, spectrum analyzer and look at your transmitted signal, you'll see that tone, it'll, it'll drop right out. You can literally subtract the level out. And we do that both on I and Q, so it's two different values in two different chains. <clears throat> so... On Rx, we do practically the same thing, except we get a little fancy here, and we have a, uh, this could just be your constant value, like we saw in DC, you're subtracting out. We also got a, it could be a running average. So what we, can, what we do here, what we do here by default with the usurps is the uh, signal comes in, and basically we subtract out an average of it, and that pulls out the DC level. So this may or may not be desirable, uh, depending upon your application, which what you actually end up with if you leave this running is there's a high pass filter with a little narrow notch cut out of your spectrum right around DC. So um, some recommended options is after you tune your front end, you can let this averager run for a while to get a sense of the DC level, and you can disable it. And that, that freezes this accumulator value. So you've essentially just self-calibrated live after tuning. Um, you know, or or you could um, potentially measure the DC value at uh, you know give a certain give a certain test input, measure the DC value, and and you could fix this at exactly what you want. So uh, I will be going over the calibration utils a little bit later. This is one of the things we don't calibrate because it's uh, actually very simple just to kind of deal with it in an automated fashion. But you could imagine sweeping across frequency and recording all of the uh, DC levels that you measure in RX and saving it into a table to be programmed in here. Let's see. Uh, so uh, I guess this is the big new thing in, in uh, kind of uh, UHD as far as the calibration goes since this Matt's impairment talk is that we've uh, got a number of utilities. They come with UHD. They install straight into your path. If you install UHD now and you type UHD underscore tab tab, you'll see these utils show up. And uh, basically, uh, for all our transceiver boards, what these utils do is basically they sweep across frequency. And at each frequency, they, um, they send out a test tone. And they actually rely on the liquid, leakage between the switches to uh, do some, uh, basically, impairments measurements and come up with the correction values. Now, these correction values are stored into a table, just a little CSV file. And they're loaded later at uh, runtime. So it's really that simple. If you happen to have created a, run a calibration on a particular daughter board, you'll have a uh, CSV file saved in your home directory uh, with the serial number of your daughter board. As soon as you try to tune that daughter board later at runtime, the uh, UHD will see that you've got a data save for it and attempt to uh, load the calibration coefficients in for, for the given frequency selected. So we've got this utility for the RX and TX IQ imbalance and one for the TX DC level. Ah, and, the, and the other, uh, let's see, the other thing to mention about this is, so um, I'll go over the UHD, uh, what we kind of do in the USERP with the, the tuning. Uh, this is a really top-level kind of block diagram, what goes on. Here's the cortex sitting in the FPGA, and here's the RF mixer on the front end. And we really have two stages worth of tuning in the USERP, both on the RX side and the, the TX side. Generally, what we do is we set the RF mixer as close as possible to the uh, desired frequency, and the cortex kind of just handles this little epsilon, this little, uh, little error in setting the uh, overall center frequency. 
But we have this concept kind of, we call it LO offset, some people will call it IF. Um, but what, we're, what you're basically doing is you're setting the uh, RF mixer to be tuned, tuned so that the LO is actually outside of your passband, and the cortic just takes up that extra kind of epsilon from the LO offset. So you still end up on the host with the same baseband samples, um, with, and you'll get your LO shifted outside of your spectrum. And so here's just a little example of how you might do this in Python. We've usually uh, we have a we have a usurp set center frequency call, and you just pass a frequency in there. But there's this tune request struct really, and you can fill it in. Here's a convenience constructor. It'll take the target frequency and an LO offset. It also has a bunch of other parameters. So you can have explicit control over how exactly you tune this and this. And you kind of you can really do any arbitrary thing with it. So. Uh, if you're curious, take a look here and take a look at the uh, doxygen for that, that class. Uh, the other neat thing a lot of people don't realize is you can actually drop this right into uh, GRC for the frequency parameter. So uh, we did a little Python magic, and this tune request under Python actually looks like it's a float, and GRC will allow you to stick it in there. So... And, you know, uh, before I, I go ahead and say, oh, well, we, you know, we've solved all our problems because you can just, t you know, tune your, uh, <clears throat> tune everything and get, get your, get your LO out of the spectrum. Well, uh, that might be okay on, in general. Uh, one, one issue with doing that is, well, you have some kind of finite bandwidth. On, on an N210, we've got 100 megahertz uh, DSP, and you can, you can literally shift the cortic up and down plus or minus 50 megahertz. And so you, you've got a fixed limit there, and then, you know, you've got some bandwidth, so you can't really shift your thing all the way up to uh, 50 megahertz, because you assume your signal is a non-zero bandwidth. Um, <clears throat> and then there, there's limited analog base band, bandwidth on the uh, front end. So even if you shifted the cortic up, let's say, uh, all the way up to 50 megahertz, you've still got, let's say, a 40 megahertz filter on the SBX, and your signal won't actually pass into it to be uh, up-converted or down-converted by the mixer. So, you, you know, you, you have some limited use of this. You have a narrowband signal or something that will fit into the passband or the uh, filters on the hardware, you can probably get away with it. And, and the other issue with this is on transmit. Like, your transmit spectrum, if you look at this, you'll really be transmitting now an LO. And if you had some IQ imbalance, uh, let's say your center frequency is at here, you'll see this whole thing over on this side of the spectrum. So, um, it's, even if you decide to tune out your, uh, distor your distortions or impairments, you still really want to run the calibration utils if you can to just clean up anything you might be sending off into unknown parts of the spectrum. You know, you might be stomping on some other guy who's transmitting out here, for example. Um, on the other hand, if you have some kind of filters on the transmit, you can just filter this all out. If you have a nice narrow band pass filter, who cares what you're sending out of band, right? So, um, I guess that, I, I, yes, enjoy the rocket cat. <clears throat> I guess the conclusion is uh, impairments going to happen, um, but I, I hope I've, you know, given a kind of laid out more, you know, more than one way you can kind of deal with it, and it's nice to be aware of it and compensate. So, you know, I think I can hop back and forth through these slides if you had any specific questions about them. So, so that's my uh, presentation. Questions? Well, if we, with the, the utilities actually try to drag the, the tones directly into the noise floor. Now, that's using leakage. So you'll see some, <clears throat> I, I guess the best thing to do is actually run the utilities, because some, sometimes it'll be like, you know, it'll say like 40 dB at this particular frequency. Like, it, you, you, really, you get, with like transmit, let's say we're dropping out the DC level, you get a really obvious tone sitting in your spectrum. And this will almost drag into the noise floor. You can't fully get rid of it. And we're also relying on leakage, so there's always a little bit more we could calibrate out, but we're not sending a really powerful signal from the transmitter and the receiver to really see all of that. And same with the IQ balance. Uh, we, we, we tend to do that. We got the one, we've got one tone we're really calibrating for, and that's a linear correction, but that's not going to be 100% true across all, uh, all baseband frequencies, so you're still going to see some kind of impairment from that. But it, it makes it much better.
Utils aren't quite doing it for you. That, that'll work pretty well for RX. Um, anything with DX? All right, all right. Well, you know, send me a screenshot or, or, or something of the, or, let's see. Any other questions? Which board does it support? Uh, we've got this uh, correction IP kind of uh, like this. This Pretty much everything I've shown here is in everything newer than uh, USERP 1. Which kind of it's in, uh, if you take a look at the FPGA code, you can see, uh, look for front, rx frontend.v and tx frontend.v, and you'll see this complete chain. Which daughter boards? Uh, the self utils will do SBX, WBX, and RFX. I think that's our, that's our main transceiver boards. Yeah, XCVR's 2450 is a little different because it's actually a half duplex, so we don't have the ability to send leakage in, into it and kind of measure that. It, it has self calibration methods, but it's it built into the Maxim chip, but it's actually drastically different, so it's not supported by this. Go ahead. Oh no, that that FPGA is packed and barely fitting most of the stuff in there. So just now, I mean, a lot of these corrections that are done in here can be done in host in sample. It's very convenient to stick it in the FPGA and not think about it, but um, they can all be done on baseband samples on the host if you really needed to. And you might have to be aware that you got a cortic in the path or disable the cortic when you do it. Uh, Anywho, I can't find the slide. Okay. I'm back. Speak loudly. Uh, calibrate with a K will uh, lock onto a GSM carrier and use that to determine the uh, frequency error in the uh, synthesizer. Correct? Yes. Just repeating for the audience, for posterity. It locks to any science, uh, any science. Um, any kind of wave it can find on the yeah, spectrum. Because actually it actually doesn't lock the GSM signal. It locks the frequency correction signal, a signal in GSM. And frequency correction is just a sign. Ah. Calibrate will lock to anything. <laughs> All right, cool, cool. So I think I was allotted an hour for this, and I probably went a little quickly, but I, no way I was. I was not going to commit to a live demo, but uh, we do have. Actually, during the uh, tunnel dot pi or so on, I think Corgan had some desire to do that, so we could show it up. Some of these utils running on the screen, and hopefully they don't, you know, fail and look embarrassing. So.